A small town in Canada discovered just how dangerous and devastating the job of rescue diving could be. The two stories in this video have to do with deadly disasters that happen in the outdoors. One of the most perilous undertakings in public service is rescue diving, but it is necessary both in life-saving and recovery situations. Panic attacks are common for novices and veterans while diving and may be provoked by situations such as entanglement, lung overexpansion, decompression sickness, or reasons unknown. Coming out of the water too quickly or making too many dives in a short period of time can also be deadly. Another hazard would be visibility. Rescue divers in rivers and lakes often can't see their hands in front of their faces. David Nicholson, 32 of Kitchener, Ontario, Canada, was married and had three sons. He was passionate about his faith and spent much of his time connecting with his community in Kitchener. David was among one of the most friendly and giving people in his town and was quite popular. He always wanted to give back to the community, so he became a constable, a peace officer under the Royal Canadian Mounted Police Act. They are not police officers, but are appointed to serve certain law enforcement functions within the township. For example, SPCA agents or court jail officers. David was a role model that could change your day, and he brought happiness to anyone he encountered. He wanted to take on more responsibility as a constable, so he became a rescue diver. He worked very hard to get the certifications, and although he hoped there was never an instance where he would be needed, he was ready to be called at all times if there was an emergency. If there was ever a place that an emergency diver would be needed, it would most likely be the Park Hill Dam Conservation Area. Park Hill Dam Conservation Area on the Grand River in Kitchener is a popular spot for recreational opportunities, including canoeing, windsurfing, fishing, hiking, snowmobiling, and tobogganing. Within the conservation area is a campground facility known as the Great Canadian Hideaway. It is a popular spot for locals, but serious hazards must be avoided. The dam has been a magnet for young swimmers, often with dangerous results. In separate incidents within a week in August 1996, two people escaped their death when their friends had to pull them out of the river when they got stuck and were in serious trouble. The dam is interesting because you can jump from the top of the dam into some calm water and then slide down the side waterfall to the rock strewn shallows below. Some dive to the dam's base where they allow themselves to be pulled through four holes that let the water flow through. These are sleuths within the dam. A sluice is a sliding gate for controlling the flow of water. It is kind of like an artificial passage for water fitted with a valve or a gate for stopping and regulating the flow. It can also be referred to as a floodgate. In October 1996, a report stated that restricting access to Park Hill Dam is unfeasible and undesirable because of the costs involved and the importance of the dam's recreational uses for residents and tourists. So the city decided to put up two no trespassing signs on the west and east bank flood walls to keep people away from the dam. Mark Gage and two of his friends had been going to the Park Hill Dam conservation area most of their life. On August 12th, 1998, they decided to head to the dam to hang out and cool off in the record-breaking Ontario heat. They didn't get there until later in the day, making it much more enticing to relax in the water after the long day. Mark was the leader of the group and was the most charismatic. He loved to make people laugh and had a strong bond with his friends and family. He was also very curious and liked to make memories by trying new adventures. He never got into trouble and wanted to get the most out of life whenever he could. Mark left the public conservation area and went down to the Grand River, intending to enter the water so his friends would not see him and wonder where he disappeared to. It was late at night, about 7.30, and the sunlight was not very strong at this point as sunset was at about 8. Mark's two friends, Ryan and BJ, started looking around for Mark after a little while. They were surprised that Mark was taking this joke so far. He would usually do something and then look for an immediate response. This time was different and it felt strange to the two friends that Mark was doing this. This joke was not funny to them, and they were starting to get frustrated. They searched the water in the area around the dam, but there was no sign of Mark. They eventually concluded that Mark must have gone home and he was probably just waiting for them there. The two friends were tired at this point and started heading back home. BJ couldn't shake the feeling that there might be something wrong with Mark, because Mark wouldn't ever want to scare them seriously. He was always about having fun and enjoying laughs. 
Alarm bells started to go off in BJ's head, and then they quickly went to the closest store for help. It had been about a half hour since they had seen Mark, and they knew that if Mark was in trouble near the dam, he would need their help immediately. Things quickly turned from a fun-loving mood to a life-or-death situation in minutes. Ryan and BJ started talking about all of the possible things that could have happened to Mark in the water, causing them to panic. They headed down to the dam to immediately start looking for Mark, calling out his name and asking anyone if they had seen their friend. Rescuers arrived at the dam quickly to help search for Mark. More and more rescuers and volunteers joined the search. Soon, it seemed like everyone in the area was searching the dam for Mark. BJ and Ryan were constantly playing over the sequence of events before they lost sight of Mark and tried to think if they could remember a crucial detail that would aid in the search. Mark's parents arrived at the dam and held pictures of their son as they watched the grim search carry on. His gym bag containing his rollerblades abandoned on the shore. When rescuers couldn't find Mark, police divers were called in. It was already dark when the first officer entered the water, hoping to search about 30 meters along the dam using an underwater light. Instead, one of these rescue divers discovered that Mark had drowned. He was sucked into a three-foot square sluice at the bottom of the dam and his body was caught on a tree stump. The force pinning him to the sluice would have been similar to having one of the front wheels of a small car parked on his chest. Three hours later, rescue diver David Nicholson entered the water to retrieve Mark's body. The plan was for David to attach a safety harness to Mark's body and use the rope to pull him onto shore with the help of many volunteers. David had a safety rope attached to him in case he was sucked onto the sluice. David swam down to Mark's body, attached the safety harness, and gave a prearranged signal to indicate to volunteers that they could start pulling the rope to get Mark off of the sluice. They made a strong pull on the rope, but to the rescuer's surprise, the rope violently jerked back because the sluice was so strong it sucked Mark back onto the gate's opening. While this was all happening, David's rope started to get extremely tight, and all of a sudden, David was trapped on the sluice right next to the sluice Mark was pinned against. Using ropes attached to the boat, firefighters tried to pull David loose, though the boat nearly went over the dam itself as they tried to get him out. Dozens of the more than 200 people lining a hill overlooking the river were enlisted to help pull on more ropes tied to David. The rescuers used all of their effort to pull on the rope attached to David, but he was lodged so firmly on the sluice that efforts to get him loose made practically no progress. The water pressure that forced David's chest against the sluice opening was so intense that even using a fire truck to pull on a safety rope failed. Then, the rope snapped and yanked part of David's safety harness out of the water. Rescue diver Robert Suve dove under the waters of the Grand River three times trying to free his friend David. Robert was also sucked in by the current and pinned against the sluice opening. Robert had a safety rope attached to him and by some miracle, when the rescuers pulled on the rope, they were able to get Robert away from the sluice. It worked and they were able to get him back to shore. When Robert was finally out of the water, he said the force of the water pressure was so strong he could barely breathe. It was a miracle his diving gear stayed intact long enough and he was able to maneuver to breathe when he got pinned on the sluice. It seemed that David was still alive, but the air in his tank would only last so long that he would die when it ran out. Police spent six hours trying to stop the water flow surging through the hole in the Park Hill Dam, but they had to call off their search attempts at about 3.30 p.m. David's body was visible on underwater cameras lowered from a boat, but there was no safe way to reach him with the threat of the sluice sucking someone else and pinning them underwater. At the time, there was no way David could have survived with the amount of air he had in the tanks with him. By 1 a.m., it became clear the diver could not be rescued. They made every effort they could think of. For nearly three hours, rescuers tried frantically to free him. Finally, three days later, David's body, still holding the body of Mark Gage, was recovered. Mark's parents, John and Jane Gage, said that they want to see safety signs around dams to warn people of the dangers under the water. Constable David Nicholson became the first police officer in the history of Waterloo Regional Police Service to die in the line of duty. For his actions, Constable David Nicholas was posthumously awarded the Ontario Medal for Police Bravery.
Ryan Osman, a 34-year-old from Mesa, Arizona, is a photographer that focuses on outdoor and lifestyle photography. He got into photography as an avid hiker and would take many photos of the sites along his hiking route. Ryan would frequently bring his girlfriend, Jessica, on his hikes, and they enjoyed hiking all over Arizona. They wanted to go on a memorable trip together and decided that Zion National Park would be the perfect place. After some thought, they decided to hike on the left fork from the bottom subway route in Zion National Park, Utah. The hike would include descending a steep and loose slope, hiking through an obstacle-filled river, and navigating sections of very slippery and wet rock formations. Zion National Park is a southwest Utah narrow preserve distinguished by Zion's canyon steep red cliffs. On February 16, 2019, Ryan and Jessica made their way to the subway trailhead. It was beautiful out and they got to the trailhead early at about 8 a.m. They were surprised to see that no one else was on the trail or in the area. They worked their way down the trail and it was everything they had expected. They got to the halfway point and it started to snow. They continued to work their way down the trail, eventually entering the subway and its steep slot canyon walls. They then reached a pond that they had to cross, and Ryan had a strange feeling about this pond because he could not see through it to the bottom. They had no choice but to cross the ice cold water and cautiously stepped into it. It seemed shallow and they worked their way across with Jessica in front of Ryan. Jessica stopped and looked back. Ryan knew that there was a problem and asked Jessica if she was okay. She could not take another step because her foot was stuck in the ground under the flowing water. She was slowly sinking and Ryan went to grab her but she fell forward into the water as she had no balance. Both of her feet were stuck and she could not pull them out. She was sinking deeper and deeper into the water. Ryan told her to stop moving and not to panic and that he would grab her and pull her out. Without hesitating, he grabbed her by the shoulders and pulled her as hard as he could. To his surprise, it worked, and Jessica was drawn out enough to where she could use her own power to get herself out. Not knowing the severity of the situation or what just happened, Ryan quickly realized that he was stuck like his feet were in dry cement. He tried not to panic, but it was getting harder and harder to keep his cool because this was one of his worst fears. He yelled at Jessica to get away from him and to get to the safe, stable part of the shore. The entire area around Ryan was quicksand. All different types of thoughts rushed through Ryan's head, but the most concerning was that the water was cooling his body temperature down and if he didn't get out quickly, he would die of hypothermia. A few moments passed by and Ryan's right leg started to sink to his thigh. It was also up to his left calf and after trying to yank himself out, he became exhausted and defeated. He was sinking deeper and deeper and at this point, he couldn't stand to get leverage to pull himself out. Jessica found the walking stick that Ryan was using. He had dropped it to free Jessica earlier. She gave him the stick along with another stick and he used them to try to set up a system to give himself leverage to get out of the quicksand. Jessica frantically started to scoop the sand from around Ryan to help him wiggle out, but it had no effect. Every time she scooped some of the sand out, it instantly refilled with even more sand. At this point, Jessica was soaking wet and starting to shiver violently. Ryan knew that if she did not get dry soon, she would become hypothermic. She stopped trying to get Ryan out and they had to make a decision on what to do next. They had no cell phone reception and there was no one around to help them. They were wet, tired, and all alone on the trail. They both realized they were in a life or death situation unless there was a dramatic shift in events. Jessica then started to panic and thought she was going to die. She thought that if she left Ryan, he would undoubtedly not make it. The only option was for Jessica to leave and try to find help. She was not confident that she'd be able to get to the car by herself as she was in a terrible mental state and Ryan was the expert navigator on the trip. She ended up leaving Ryan to get help and then to make matters worse, a hard snow started. Ryan was shivering and in pain from when he was trying to yank his leg out of the sand. He began to have very dark thoughts about what would happen to him. He was wearing essential clothing to keep warm, but as time passed, he was getting colder and colder. The water cools your body down much faster than air, so water is very efficient at pulling the heat away from your body. By this point, Ryan was propped up by the sticks but exhausted. He knew that if he fell asleep, there could be a chance that he would not wake. 
despite his best efforts to stay awake, he fell asleep in between the two sticks. Suddenly, he woke up and his body slipped off the stick setup and fell into the water. The extreme cold was causing his muscles and joints to not work correctly. He pulled himself out of the water, but at this point, things were looking grim and he was starting to hallucinate. He had been stuck for five hours now and the sun was setting, taking with it the only source of heat that was helping keep him alive. Ryan was experiencing a lot of pain and not thinking clearly. He knew that it was a matter of time before he passed out from the cold and that he would probably fall back into the water and drown. He was delirious by this point, but then saw a flash of light hit him in the face. Ryan started yelling and a rescuer started yelling back. He ran up to Ryan and strapped himself onto the rock to ensure he didn't sink in when trying to help Ryan. He said that Jessica made it out safe and alerted rescue and that she was okay. At first, the rescuer attached a pulley system around Ryan's waist, with the other end attached to a gigantic rock. Then he started ratcheting Ryan out, and it was so painful, Ryan started screaming. The rescuer had a dry suit and began to dig around Ryan's leg, but realized it was going nowhere. Then, he secured the rest of the area and waited for his crew. Two rescuers showed up and held Ryan under each of their shoulders and they attached a strap to his kneecap. Ryan's leg was so cold, whenever the rescuers touched his skin, it felt like a knife. One of the rescuers started to dig as fast as he could while another person ratcheted the rope attached to the rock. It felt like a crazy amount of pressure ripping off Ryan's leg. Finally, the rescuers started pulling as hard as they could, and Ryan screamed for them to keep going because he felt like he was slowly getting out. After about three more ratchets, Ryan's leg was out of the ground. The pressure released, and they dragged him to the side of the canyon. At this point, Ryan had no feeling in his leg. He checked to make sure it was still attached. Then, they put Ryan in a sleeping bag with some heating pads. Unfortunately, it was dark, and the weather was too bad for a rescue helicopter to come in, so Ryan and a rescuer had to camp out for the night on the trail. They gave him an IV and some strong pain medication. When they woke up at 6 a.m. the following day, there was six inches of snow over the top of his sleeping bag. Around noon, the helicopter finally arrived and the weather was getting better. Ryan was flown out to St. George Hospital. They assessed him and found minor injuries. The whole ordeal traumatized Ryan. He had dreams of falling into water and drowning. However, he is doing much better now and has a thriving photography business. You can inquire about his breathtaking photos and services at ryanosmanphoto.com. I want to say thanks for watching the video and don't forget to subscribe if you like the content. As always, please be extra nice to the like button and I have many other disaster videos on my channel that you might want to check out. See you at the next one.